Hello. <laughs> Thanks for coming tonight to uh, learn about water catchment. I'm Nikki with Split Pea Edible Landscaping. Uh, we are a design to build a landscaping company that focuses on earth first processes uh, to help create habitats, responsible habitats, and a desert climate for people and pollinators and wildlife. Um, one of the things that we do is utilize, and in that process, is utilize the resources we have when we have them and try to create closed loop systems. And a portion of that is rainwater catchment, even in a desert climate. Before I get too far into that, I do want to just mention that I have never been trained professionally in rainwater catchment. There's not a lot of programs, um, but I have been playing and uh, failing and succeeding and um, trialing and taking data for probably 15, 20 years now. And I'm just I'm here today to share some of those things with you. Uh, a good place to get started. Okay. And I can get really chatty and fast and loud and excited and sometimes derail and go off. So if anybody feels like that's happening, just, you know, wave your arms in the air and I'll get back on track. Okay. Oh, okay. That's where it happens. Excels in technology. <laughs> Okay, so before we talk about how to utilize rainwater, how to collect rainwater, let's talk a little bit about where does it go if we don't capture it. You've got this resource coming down from the sky and it's going where? And I'd like to bring Jess up from Ada Soil and Water Conservation to talk a little bit about that. Hi, um, so I'm Jess with the Ada Soil and Water Conservation District. I'm coordinating the event for tonight. We help people, landowners, um, farmers, everybody with better conservation practices. And so rainwater in Idaho is an especially big topic. And where does it go? Um, if we don't capture it, it goes away. We, um, by either paving over the land or having a lot of erosion, we send a lot of our water downstream. And uh, we use in Idaho, um, I think it's between 75 and 90 percent of our drinking water alone comes from the aquifer. So they're really important. And by us sending the water downstream, uh, we're not really doing ourselves any favors uh, with the reclamation. Yeah, it's important that we have that in our system, especially since it is such a big source for drinking water in our high desert climate, that we actually keep it in the soil and filtering down and, you know, cleansing that water through the aquifer process um, instead of sending it away, which is why we're here tonight, because we think it's such a big topic, especially as we really urbanize rapidly. Um, the more surfaces that we're paving over, the more water we keep on sending away. So talking about how to capture any of this uh, rainwater is really important as um, we're developing so quickly. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, so now we know that we want to capture it. That's why we're here, because we see a problem. We are trying to fill a need. Um, we are, you know, several, several years into a drought. We're two plus years into this last heat dome where we, heat dome is when the heat of the ocean, the ocean water heat kind of is trapped in the atmosphere and creates a dome, and that's why we're so dang hot. Uh, that's what I have been told. We are calling this heat thing. <laughs> by the people who have studied that. Hey, um, so let's talk then about how do we capture it and how do we utilize it? And that's what the bulk of our program will be about tonight. They telling me now that I have to credit everybody I take, that I take pictures from. So that's where those came from, the World Wide Web. Okay, so is anyone familiar with uh, permaculture in here? Yeah, a little bit here and there. Permaculture is kind of the symbiotic relationship between humans and nature, the way nature sees it. So uh, like biomimicry, replicating patterns we see in nature, treating nature, uh, uh, stewarding the natural world the way the natural world would want us to steward it um, based on their systems that are already working. So one of the principles, there are 12 principles in permaculture, and one of them is to observe and interact. And it's one of my favorites and also least favorites because I'm not patient, um, but this is such a critical point in 
uh, land stewardship, resource utilization. And so I'm going to come back to this point of observing and interacting several times tonight. Um, so first thing we're going to do, decide if we want to capture water on our, and on our property. Uh, so we're going to get out and we're going to interact in our spaces, uh, setting up and utilizing these, these water systems can feel kind of intensive in the beginning, especially if you, you know, there will be some systems in here that you see that feel elaborate and some that feel uh, very simple, the bucket and drip method, which is perfectly reasonable for water catchment, especially if you're starting off. The system that you end up putting in place long term um, will depend on how much you want to commit to uh, uh, changing that system as your space changes, because every year that means a little bit of maintenance or a little bit of something that needs to be adjusted for a new changing climate and land after you've pushed water through it, plants have grown and whatnot. The most successful uh, water catchment systems are given attention to and adjusted over time, but you can start small. So how do we get out and observe and interact? You take the time, you wait. Uh, you spend the season paying attention to the areas around your home, um, feel the soil, watch the plants, watch the wildlife that comes in. Where are, are things visiting? Oh, good. Maybe in the bottom floor. But get down and dirty, get out in your space before you start making decisions about just visual decisions when you step back at your house. Pay attention to what the, the space is asking of you first. So let's go through kind of a walkthrough. We're gonna come and walk through your space and talk about what that might mean. Um, when you're looking around your space, you're gonna look for excessive wet areas, excessive dry areas, high areas, low areas, areas that stay shady, one of my favorite tools for watching the sun is your phone, taking pictures every two hours in the middle of the summer and then in spring, summer, fall, and winter. So you have a good idea so that you can start mapping those things out when you're um, tracking where you might want to place water for winter storage or place water, so hold water so that it doesn't get algae in the summer because of extreme temperatures. Those are all things you want to be observing, observing, observing everything that you think and think may not be important to know for water catchment. Start a journal. Uh, I know that a, a lot of people say, you know, start a gardening journal and start writing things down, but our lives are so busy these days that if we don't write things in front of us, by the time fall comes, we forgot that our system is broken and it didn't get to 50 feet away and we really needed it to, and then the next season is gone and pretty soon we're like, never mind, that's a lot of work. So write things down so that you can go back and know, take, uh, and, and you're not repeating yourself if you don't have to, repetition happens. Um, okay, paying attention to the trees in your landscape. Are there large trees? And under those large trees, do you have dry soil or do you have really wet soil? And is it compacted? And do you have root systems that are up or are root systems down and there's plentiful space below there? That's all important for capturing and um, keeping water in the soil. After a good rain or snow, uh, I recommend to folks, if you've got places that you're thinking, hey, maybe I say you have clay soil, maybe you want to create a, uh, a collection pond because you've got clay soil. Well, dig a little hole right before a rainstorm, see how long it takes to drain. Do that in a couple of different areas so that you can see, is my soil full of organic matter and, and do, or is it sand and I have excellent drainage or is it clay and I've got no drainage? Before you can decide what you're gonna do with your rainwater catchment and how you're gonna collect and get it from point A to point B, you need to know what's happening in the ground to help support you get it there. You're getting it there. Last time we were able to dim the lights up here. Do you remember maybe these back here? Might get weird for a minute. Almost. That's better. Thanks. Is that okay with everybody? Good job, yeah. Okay. I'm like squinting at the screen. So what are we looking for with plants when we're uh, walking around our space and assessing where our main water tank might go or may, where we want to get the water we are collecting to go to? Um, who's thriving and who needs more support? These are the same plant. One gets water four times a year. The other one gets no water except for from the sky and is up against the sidewalk with gradient heat. Maybe I should figure out how to get this guy who's not thriving but hanging on some water. Is your soil too dry? If you run a hose over it and you've got these giant ravines in there, 
are is the water just seeping and seeping and seeping and going into nowhere? Is your soil dry and cracked? Or is it saturated? Does it smell bad? Is there no oxygen in it? Or is it just right? Do you have coverage? Goldilocks with soil, you know? My volume and speed's okay with everyone? Have you considered your trees? I'm gonna talk about trees a lot tonight. I'm probably gonna say, have you considered the trees several times? But you know, tree canopies, even in our wettest months, underneath their actually <laughs> for uh, of evergreens are not getting saturated at that ground level because they're protected by their canopies. So paying attention to your trees um, in the heat of the summer, in the winter when they're not getting water like anything else, and then during spring and fall when those rains are coming also. So how do you get water to your big mature trees and keep them healthy? Maybe that's a great way to utilize your three water tanks that you have and collect, and that's one supplemental water for the season. One supplemental water of anything is still better than pulling it from resources that are not from the sky. Okay, so you've walked around your space, you're super excited, you're gonna capture some water. Now what are we gonna do? Anyone? Nothing? We're asking more questions. So we do. We ask lots of questions, we observe, and we interact, and we step back and we see one rain come through and then we try something even if it's a bucket maybe you just want to collect one bucket and see how long it takes to fill up we're and then we step back and we ask more questions we don't dive all the way in very first without having long-term observation and interaction so one of the questions we need to ask is where are we going to get our water from uh, where's the nearest catchment opportunity Typically, that means it's coming from a rooftop or a flat surface or something that some surface that it can collect water off of. Uh, sometimes it's tighter. Um, it's coming straight from a downspout. Sometimes you might have a drip or a leak on the side of a house. Uh, sometimes you don't have gutters and you've just got a flush of water coming off the rooftop. Get some gutters. Um, maybe you have landscape runoff. Maybe your runoff is coming from straight over a patio and is washing down the concrete into nothingness, or maybe it's floating down the driveway. Missed opportunities. So where can we collect water from? Uh, oh, I already talked about that. I'm getting ahead of myself. Try to install gutters along all the rooftop surfaces, but don't think just general home rooftop. If you've got homesteads and you've got chicken poops or sheds for your tools or lean-tos or bike farms or all the cool things people are putting roofs on these days, Put some gutters on it and start collecting water from there. Uh, this is a portion of my greenhouse. And so I just have a single gutter that goes along the back. And then all that water goes into a collection tank down here, which you'll see another picture of shortly. Uh, and then that water feeds the plants inside the greenhouse until it drains. Meaning until it's uh, been used up or the resource is gone. Here. Uh, Hey, boy, I just have to ask today. So this, this collects off of this entire, just this twin wall top. Gets collected into this gutter here, gets piped in here, or uh, collected down in here. And then this tank also acts as insulation for the greenhouse both during summer and um, winter. So I can access from the inside of the greenhouse there to feed and all the water all those plants. Talk about the tools for holding and directing your rainwater. So we're going to go over. This will probably be the longest portion of the. We'll go through all of this kind of slow. If anybody needs me to um, back up a slide, if you want to take pictures and set of notes, just let me know, and I will try to back up. Last time we were not allowed to. Not allowed. Not able. Nobody wasn't allowed. Okay. First thing we're going to um, talk about for our tools is storing water at the source. So that means direct from your runoff point. Does that that means from your rooftop or whatever surface for surface you're collecting water at? Um, storing water at the source means storing it in troughs, barrels, cisterns, water tanks. Um, typically, you're storing it for future use. Although some folks will fill their bins during a rainstorm and then. Um, utilize that as a point to direct things under trees during a rainstorm as well. So it can be used for both immediate and uh, and future use. Often they're gravity fed, but again, if you put a pump in, pumps are a pill. They're not my first choice. They usually need filters to be cleaned. Layla, you probably know all about pump and filter nightmares. 
Um, anyway, try not to utilize a pump if there are other ways, uh, unless you have the mental bandwidth for that. Uh, often they're used for spot watering or flooding a space. Uh, and you can use hose, hoses, tubing, and pipes to help you get through all of that, or to, to get your water from point A to point B. So I wonder if this works now too. It does. Often when you're collecting from a rooftop, there uh, you usually have some sort of downspout, whether that's gutters, a simple gutter system like this one we have here, or really cool systems like this one here, where all the water from this rooftop angle and that section all get filtered into a big holding tank that's sitting on a concrete patio right here. And then once this is full, they have diverters that go straight into with a ball valve that go straight into the landscape and fill their swales. I'll show you all about this later. It's pretty awesome. And they're in the first stages of uh, utilizing rainwater for their entire landscape. So it's a very slow, painful process, but it will be totally worth it. So here's the ball valve that I was mentioning. After this tank that is over here, it collects all of this water. Then this just fills right now. They turn this ball valve and it all gets released down here. It's just some more pictures of this system. This is their catchment tank that's on the front. They're not, their system. Yeah, let's say they're not home and there's a lot of rain and they forgot to turn the ball out to release the water. They, they have, have a safety backup. Yep, it's down. I think we're going to be able to see that in one second. There's a, we're going to talk about uh, water excess, which is important to have a plan for because we almost always have it and never plan for it because we don't think we are getting much. Um, so we're going to talk about how to direct excess water and what kind of plans they have in place for overflow. So this one has an overflow that then drains out on a, go ahead. Um, I'm curious about those ball valves too. Is this, is this particular one in Idaho? Yeah, North um, End. Huh? North End. North End. Um, I have a friend who uh, farms in, uh, out by Mountain Home. Uh -huh. He has irrigation and stuff and one of his one of the veins of his existence is uh, frozen valves, frozen yeah, frozen yeah. valves. Yeah. And so, especially, and one of the things I'm really worried about is uh, uh, most of our water comes in the winter time. Right. And so, how do I how do I prevent my various valves from freezing and breaking? And sure. It's uh, long. We will talk about some uh, winter. Um, uh, catchment care and opportunities and the lack of opportunity also, um, mostly because of our temperature. So we can we'll talk about some of that and I'll uh, touch on um, fall valves. This is two winters. This will be its second winter. So last winter was their first winter and they didn't have any problems, but they weren't, cap they were not capturing during I mean, their tank was full before winter. So they, mm -hmm. yeah, so they, and they ended up draining. Well, we'll talk about that. I'm getting ahead of myself, but remind me, okay, if I don't touch on it again. Here's another tank, um, same house, whole, but their catchment, their main catchment tank does not include their overhead patio or their covered patio on their porch. So you don't want to forget about small spaces like that. Again, sheds, covered patios. That, um, the surface area of this of this covered patio fills this entire tank. This is their overflow for. Here's this is a better uh, visual of the overflow when it gets this tall. I mean this tall, this high up. So when it gets this high, then it overflows down into here. They also have an overflow, or this is how they water. And I think there's an overflow on this back side or another access port or something. They utilize their overflow to fill a, a pond tiny pond right here um, that they grow food crops in, food and ornamental crops. Here's that ball valve again. Maybe we'll just talk about it the whole time. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know enough about, um, you're just not, I don't know that you'd have such a problem like Big Ag would. You know, and the goal for if you're collecting water in the winter, there's if you're collecting water in the winter, there's specific spaces that you have to have that tank so that 
it can be utilized and not frozen and it doesn't freeze. Now, some folks I have seen put water tanks inside of their garage with very elaborate systems. That is not my jam, it freaks me out to have <laughs> lots of big water tanks inside a building. Um, I hope I get there someday, but right now I'm just gonna keep myself on the outside <laughs> where I need it. So, you know, this spot has radiant heat from, from their fence, from the patio below. It's completely locked by house and concrete and not natural setting. So that might help keep this guy. I'm guessing that's what allows them to collect, would allow them to collect in the winter if they didn't fill their tank ahead of time, which is awesome. Oh, so then here's another ball valve. Um, the ball valves are great because that allows you to control control the flow of the water when it's coming out of the tank because that will go so fast and then it's gone and you have you know lost everything you spent all this time collecting. So placing strategic, some sort of strategic stopping and starting turn on, turn off system is really important when you're gonna be utilizing uh, your water tanks. Here is the uh, final end. This is, this is their big water tank, PVC. They turn it on right here. It goes out here and then this is just on the other side of this. And then you can see that they've dug, uh, they dug swales and there's a gate right here. So once this water goes out and they can control Rocks are here because that flow is so high that it just pushes the soil away. Uh, that pressure of that flow is so high that it just pushes the soil away. So they had to, to slow that flow even more than just there and protect that soil. Uh, so then this flows through the, through the landscape and is water from the bottom uh, supporting deep root systems instead of shallow root systems. It's certainly something they have to, you have to spot water with this swale system uh, the first couple of years while you're establishing perennials and shrubs and whatnot. And then it all gets taken care of on the bottom side. Any questions so far? Cool. Rain barrels. Everybody, this is like the thing that gets everybody into this, right? They see the rain barrel and this is a fabulous way to get started. There's a lot, a, there's a lot to learn about water catchment and endless possibilities with how and what to use and when to use it, where to use it, what to add and how to get water from point A to point B. But this is a really easy way to start out and not feel overwhelmed. A single bucket, typically they're kind of cute, you know, kind of cute. Um, you can do something that is completely, um, you know, utility option, uh, but basically they all have a hose bib on the bottom. Typically they're up a little bit higher than the ground level, but it's it'll just be slower once it gets down there if it's on the ground level. I am pretty sure, somebody asked me what the heck this was in the last class. I am pretty sure this is their overflow. And there's actually, I don't know, I did not look at this picture close enough before I uh, put it on here from the internet. But they should be able to fill this tank, and then whenever this tank, I don't know what's happening here. You had your I actually have that. You do. So yeah, what is this? In, inside is, I guess if you can imagine a, a square, it's open in the middle and ridged around the outside. The water, the, what they according to the according to the brochure, yeah, uh, it says that the water tends to cling to the outside of the. Uh, Oh, the outside, inside of the of yeah, this. Oh. Yeah, it clings to that, and as long as your bucket isn't full, it will it will go in cool. to there. And then once your bucket is full, it'll just overflow and dump down in the middle of that square. Uh, like a, if you imagine like a ridged ring, a ridged square ring around the outside. Water goes in there, and then when it gets full enough, that of course, flows. that makes that does make sense. So have you used it? I haven't, I haven't hooked it up yet. We're going to recite our house, and I don't want to yep. put anything in anybody's way. Yeah, cool. I I hope somehow I'll hear about that. And we we actually use the same kind of buckets. We got those on the same kind of barrels. We found them on Craigslist for ten bucks a piece. Isn't that an incredible resource? And, uh, Marketplace. And, <clears throat> and I. Getting one of them, ours were white, and I was worried about algae, so I spray painted it black. And so far, the paint seems to be holding. Um, I, I was worried about yeah. uh, holding on to plastic. You know, yeah. So far, so good. Cool, really like especially for heat in summer and yeah. dry and weather extremes. Yeah. Awesome. Hey, thanks for that information. I sat there and went, 
Actually, I've got no idea what's happening. You can put another very similar hose in the other side if you want. And, and For the overflow? Daisy chain. Yeah, so there's, I wonder if I can. So happy I can go backwards today, like this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Over here. We're going to talk about platform platforms today, too. <coughs> These are. <coughs> Hey, girls. Okay, so a great way to get started while you're assessing what your your uh, most amount you can capture, what your bandwidth is, any little bit really does count, really does matter. Here's a family. Oh, you can't you can let them see this. Uh, rain chain utilizes a rain chain, and then this uh, rain barrel here. Can you can see that okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, then she just pulls a line, a hose line, and waters this, waters these, water these. When the water's gone, it's gone. Everything has to fend for itself. That's how she decided what stays and what goes. Oh man. Okay, open tanks and drops. This is my favorite, mostly because I'm I'm a very visual person. I want to see what kind of water is is happening in there. I want to know what's going on in the water. I want to be able to feel it and look at it and touch it and smell it. Uh, and I'm very multi-purpose. Not a big fan of a single. I feel like that you can always find something to do with multiple things to do with something. And so these water tanks allow you to use these for grow spaces also and create these tiny little microclimates and uh, habitats and provide for pollinators and for birds and for wildlife all at the same time. So open tanks and drops. And I'm sure everyone's like, yeah, but the mosquitoes. We'll get there. Promise. I also have a question. What about, I think you're told wildlife small wildlife falling into something like yep. that. We'll, we'll get there too. Good point. Everybody's, I'm stoked everybody's asking questions today. <laughs> okay, here's one of my lessons that I learned. This was a total rookie mistake. I've been catching water for 15 years at this point, moved into my new house, threw all these stock tanks up against the wall, November of the day we moved in, and then all the rain happened and I was like, what have I done? I <laughs> have these giant, heavy, heavy tanks and everything's just overflowing onto my entire boat, uh, right up against the foundation. So lesson learned, right? You utilize that water, get it out of space, make your adjustments. One of the ways you can help avoid this um, situation besides just moving it out a little bit uh, is creating platforms for these to sit on that are stable because otherwise you don't really consider you know, once the ground is saturated all around it, the bricks that are on might move just a little bit more. Everything's kind of going to shift. And it is important to have, if you're going to have open tanks without your overflow system set up yet. I mean, this really was shame on me because I've been doing this for so long at my other house, at house that it was silly that I didn't think about this. Uh, anyway, here's a platform system that we put in for um, somebody and she's gutters are next. So she'll get gutters, she'll have a downspout that comes here, she'll utilize a trough tank on this first uh, platform. The overflow will go into this second platform here. The overflow for this one goes into a tank that sits on the ground, much like the one I just had a big round tank. And then this overflow uh, waters a passive fungal bed. Capturing and utilizing every resource to its maximum the whole way down. So then now we've got all these open tanks, and these uh, excellent spaces for mosquitoes to move in and, and make millions. Oh, we're not there yet. Sorry, let me backtrack. Uh, so, because we already talked about this, have a plan for excess. I am both uh, passive and intensive and very intentional with my water catchment. Um, I have I have spaces that I just allow them to do whatever they're going to do with water catchment. My overflow directs itself because I've set it up that way. I have places like this system uh, where I'm moving this corrugated tube and I'm paying attention every single time. If I'm going out of town and it's the middle of the winter, uh, I'm going to put my overflow tubes out immediately. That's just where the water is being directed. We don't need to capture anything at that moment because that's how my system is set up. Now you certainly would be want to be considering those things if you're if you travel or have gone a lot 
Uh, probably you don't have to worry about it. That's only in the summer because you know that's not when the rains are here. Um, so having a plan for excess is really important. And sometimes that means moving this tube from place to place, utilizing things that you have. A gutter. I have a piece of a gutter left left over, and not enough um, tubing to get from the point that I really wanted to go. So I just throw that down in the um, let the water drain where I want it to when I'm moving it to that spot. Right here, this, believe it or not, has just enough of a pitch that my all of my overflow, if I messed up or if it happened overnight and I forgot, I fell asleep, all of my overflow happens at this spot right here. So I just channel that then out into the uh, into the ground cover. Oh, here this here this is again. That's where that water uh, overflows and then and then just feeds all of this down below. Questions about this? Am I all over the place? That's pretty well my style, bouncing. <laughs> hmm. Water from this tank right here uh, is collected and uh, from a, it was collected from a drip that was right over here. Uh, and then that all of that water was used to feed this system until I had it on a drip line in the summer. A, a couple of years later, and then excess from this space just overflowed into this area here. You're if you're looking at overflow and you've got flat tanks, and I'm saying there's just enough of a tilt, it really is so small. You're not looking at that tank and you, you don't see a big difference. You don't want anything to be gushing out. You're just tilting in the smidge so it has somewhere to go softly and it's not disrupting all the ground below it. Okay, another view of this uh, water, the water that's collected off the greenhouse goes and keeps that, um, the plants inside of there happy, and then the overflow this is tilted just enough that it feeds this elderberry, which gets zero water uh, from the sky during any time that there's a giant silver maple over the top of it. So it is dry, dry, dry underneath there. The tree gets whatever water is available, so any of the overflow then is fed to the water, or to the elderberry. Those are plants inside the greenhouse. Um, here we are. Now we're back on track. Keeping the water clean and pest free. Uh, I am a big fan of air stones. Has anyone seen those? Okay, cool. I've got a picture. <laughs> air stones. These are awesome. Um, you buy this little uh, pump and plug in all these quarter inch tubes and then put these air stones in. <laughs> you can have one or two air stones in a tank, in a trough tank that's about the size that I've been showing you here. And just and that just keeps the water circulated enough to not have it be stinky and not have any mosquitoes. Everything else is open air. I haven't had any problems by utilizing these air stones. And you can find them uh, with a plug-in, electric plug-in or solar. And I would say if you are finding a solar stone it might be more worth your while to do a solar panel and plug the pump into the solar panel because they're just not they're just not advanced enough for them to be sustainable they're you'd be replacing them frequently so we're still testing the solar options for those <clears throat> trialing them here and there uh so this is an air stone you can use mesh netting, like screen mesh screening. That's what a lot of folks use. They just lay it over the top, put a big wire around it, and then um, tighten the wire around the edge. Um, I don't prefer that method because I really like there to be water movement happening. So things can't get in, but also you still have water sitting. And if you don't have water, uh, oxygen in the water, then we have all sorts of problems with it being slimy and algae and stinky and gross. You're still probably going to have some algae here and there anyway, because the water coming off the roof is not sterile. Um, and then my my favorite, uh, beside these these air stones, I use in um, combination with pond plants or water cleaning plants or water loving plants. And and because I have an edible landscaping part. Uh, I typically try, try to push myself towards water loving food crops. So far, I haven't felt concerned enough to worry about what is happening, the water that's coming off of my rooftop into my collection tanks, feeding, having some sort of toxicity that's you know, being soaked up by plants. We do the best we can with what we have available. 
But if you were concerned about that, you should look into biochar um, bags for purifying water. We won't say that word anymore tonight because I could go for days talking about that too. Oh, here's inside of that system. So that's where that downspout comes in. And then that all collects in this uh, tank that's both half in and half out. We have some plants that sometimes get water fed, um, bottom water fed if the water is up high enough to that level. Um, and then that's just what those air. This is the middle of the winter. Uh, no problems keeping it uh, because the air is circulating and this is partial inside, partial outside greenhouse. This tank never freezes. My tanks that are fully exposed outside usually have about 12 to 18 inches of uh, liquid in the bottom and then like a six inch cap of ice on top. My air stones are still going down there. Utilizing plants then. So why do we want to do that? For oxygen, to create shade for your space, for the, for the tank that it's holding so that you can keep algae low. For pollinator support, you know, often you have wildlife or bees or um, insects that come and fly over big tanks and you have, you know, insect massacre because there's nothing for them to sit on. So one thing you can do is provide some sort of floating top, floating cover, even if it's something like um, lilies in the, in lily pads in the pond or something that are sitting there, something that a, a, a insect can land on and get a drink of water without, um, without, being, without drowning. Uh, you can also float logs or sticks on top of there. Um, you can place, if this is our water tank, you can place you know, uh, two by four or sticks or something. Typically you wanna sink one portion into the bottom. So if a bird is stuck, there's some way for that bird to walk out once it hits the, um, stick that's been that's penetrated below the water line. Uh, uh, plants will help clean up your water, so your water is technically then safer when it's going back out into the landscape. Um, and this is watercress, so I can harvest this crop and eat it in my salad if I want to. So that feels pretty rad to me. Little wins, you guys. Little wins. Here's another example. Um, that tank you saw that had the covered patio area overflows into this uh, little pond here, and they're growing things like wapato, which is a tuber, indigenous tuber, uh, indigenous food tuber crop. Um, there's some, uh, this is a lotus or a lily or something, and then there's some things like rumex and a couple of other plants up there, some ornamental, some things that they can harvest to eat. So this is just another example of a collection tank uh, and I think they actually, excuse me, this is an overflow tank, and they actually have fish in this pond. These are the same folks with the big swales that use that flood system from their tanks. Here's a grown up version of that. This is that Wapato cattails. Anybody ever had cattail pollen? Use cattail pollen? No? Oh my gosh. But not the, okay, when it's, Pollen season for that. Go and put a paper bag on it and shake it. And nobody in the World Wide Web do this and you know be sick or anything. Disclaimer. <laughs> but you can use it to substitute out like a fourth of your flour in a recipe, in a baking recipe. Hundred percent ID first. Do me. Again, I'm, I'm super passive, super intensive, all in the same plot of land. So uh, tubing, corrugated tubing, perforated tubing, downspout emitters, PVC, all sorts of things you can use to get water from point A to point B. Sometimes we use tubing to direct water during the rainfall. Maybe it's just, maybe it's just corrugated tubing coming directly from the downspout over here. Um, sometimes it's to direct excess water from the holding tanks. Maybe this has a, a, you have tubing systems to control your overflow and those are being channeled out in far places. Maybe those are even in-ground tubing. That's even in-ground tubing that has an overflow. Ooh, how cool would that be? If you could like, oh man, okay, hang on. <laughs> Take it easy. <laughs> we'll get there, self. And then of course it's used when you're um, accessing your stored water. Give me, give me, give me. 
this area only uses rainfall. And so this tube goes all the way across the driveway from some random downspout in the middle of the pavement land. And I pull it all the way over to this tiny little wedge of earth. And this is two years later, just with the appropriate plants put in that space, capturing just the rainfall water. <clears throat> How cool, right? <laughs> Again, corrugated tubing uh, coming down straight from the downspout, and that way I can move this any which way I want to. I have a tank that's over here, right here, so I can move this tube when I want to. Um, I need to get I need to get water over to the raspberries over here uh, during a tiny, tiny thunderstorm that we had. You bet it watered my raspberries. Pretty stoked about that. So my corrugated tube wasn't long enough. This is where I just stuffed that other piece of gutter to go in. Doesn't have to be fancy. If fancy is your jam, it can absolutely be fancy. Okay, here's where I was going feeling excited about this in-ground situation. Has anyone ever seen these pop-up drain emitters? Yeah, you're the only one, huh? No. That's because you're not supposed to see them. <laughs> you, ran, you ran a downspout underneath our cabinet. Oh, nice. All the way to the back of the yard. To the lawn. Right the, cool. And water, 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 water. Can anybody hear? Did everybody hear that? So these, maybe not you. These awesome pop up drain emitters are a way for this is a great, this is great if you like clean, not corrugated tubing and rain gutters everywhere. And, you know, such. If you need the clean appearance, or if you live in an HOA who is dictating your guidelines about uh, rainwater collection, and I see that often, HOAs may not allow a rain barrel. This is an excellent option for getting your water where you need it to go uh, when the resource is available. So the rainwater comes down from this gutter, fills into this teeny tiny box, and then uh, this tube is run, like he said, underneath some sort of um, surface. So his is underneath the driveway, uh, which has to be done before the driveway is poured. Uh, <clears throat> we've seen those things before. We've seen some really strange things where they just pop up in the middle of a concrete driveway and you're going, <laughs> you might as well just let it run off. There's a lot of extra work there. Uh, but this is a great way um, to get from point A, where you're collecting the water all the way out to somewhere like a tree that needs to be dewatered, or a lawn, or a bed that's sunken, like you're saying it happens at your house. And what I was thinking with this overflow, when I got excited and had to pull myself back, is that your overflow, this could be attached to your overflow. So you have your collection tanks, once that is right up here, and then once that is filled, your overflow would flow into this and then dewater everything out far away. That's cool. Like that idea. Get to work after I am served. <laughs> Any questions on these? They actually pop up like a sprinkler, or it doesn't like it just bubbles out. So it's more like flood irrigation. So you want to make sure that's being captured somewhere, whatever your end terminating point is for this. You don't want that to be just running off into the street which is often what we see from these. They put them right at the very edge to get it so that it, I'm not sure why they do that, actually. I couldn't explain it if I tried. It's really easy to accidentally cover it up, too. So put a yeah. decorative rock by it or something so you don't- You're very right about that. Wood chips over it or- And then the wood chips get in the vase and- Yeah. yeah. You've done this before. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. But these are right for the right place, for sure. Does anyone in HOA neighborhoods? Yeah, do you guys know what your guidelines are, restrictions about water catchment? There, I, there's nothing that I've found do in our, our covenants <laughs> that says anything about like guidelines for cool. water catchment. So maybe you start with a rain barrel just to do a cute one. <laughs> and you too, you, do you know what your guidelines are? Cool, I mean, try it and see what happens. And I, I do want to say, too, that HOAs are really coming around. When you start throwing words at them like sustainability and drought, water-wise, and that sort of thing, um, year-round interest, there's lots of words you can use to convince your HOA. I can imagine that my HOA, we have a, a 
a shared pond for all oh, the fun, and that feeds everyone's sprinklers. And we always have trouble with people watering too much or too often, and we sometimes run out of water. So HOA board, here you come. Yeah, they, should, <laughs> they shouldn't have a problem with this if it's going to extend the whole neighborhood. Yeah. yeah, yeah, cool. Well, that that issue goes beyond HOAs, though. I mean, even farmers' water rights, uh, you know, everything goes downhill, right? Yeah. Counties get involved. Right. Or so on and so forth. So it's illegal in a lot of places to have water catchment systems. Not in, it is not illegal to have water catchment in Idaho. Just to clear that one up right now. Lots of other places, you're correct. Uh, you cannot capture water. Rainwater systems are not legal here. Rainwater catchment systems are um, supported by the city. And we did double check if rainwater catchment is even in the state code. So you guys are covered across the board. And we also, I've heard rumors that Suez, now Veolia, was unsupportive of rain barrels. Um, but actually, we've been in communication with them, and they are very supportive of rain barrels and actually helped us promote this class. So you won't run into any issues. Um, as far as we know, we've tried to do our due diligence just to make sure we that there's no residential concern. rainwater collection the end. <laughs> Correct. And there is still, right, um, if you are on an irrigation system, I believe then there are limitations about capturing the runoff in the fields, but I don't think that, you know, that's not the topic of this class. We are just really talking about the great barrels. Um, irrigation runoff from farmers' fields is a whole different topic. But, but you're right. Yes. Absolutely. Water's tricky, especially in Idaho. Yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit about swales, ditches, trenches, uh, directing water from one place to another uh, by uh, changing the way that it moves through the space. Um, so sometimes swales are used to get to, to water along a long length. Water along a long length. I've got great words on Tuesday evening. Um, so to water as you're getting from point A to point B. If you've got something where uh, you've got a small swale that's going through two beds on either side, that would be an appropriate use to use a swale instead of um, a PVC pipe or a corrugated, corrugated tube because only getting it from here to there without dropping anything the, the, uh, around that during that um, movement. Uh, if you need to get at longer distances and you have enough pressure, if you've got huge tanks, then you can get by utilizing swales. If you have the right kind of soil, um, you can use swales to get uh, water from point A to point B that's a longer distance. And then you can use them directly under a downspout. So if you want to water the entire space every single time, and you don't have collection tanks or any way of collecting water, but you can create a small trench along a driveway or something, uh, then you can just have your downspout go directly into a swale or a ditch, fill that up and flood, uh, maybe even into a collection pond or something. Any questions so far? Am I too back and forth and back and forth? I don't know what I do about it, but I'm going to actually I keep coming back to this house. Whose foot is that? The homeowner's foot. <laughs> <laughs> They're barefoot kind of people. <laughs> um, okay, maybe this is just a better view of these swales. So here's the water. This tube right here, PVC pipe is right at this point. And this uh, gate opens if they want the water to go this way, closes if they want to raise the water uh, to feed along these ditches a little bit higher first. She travels all the way over here and then uh, basically floods kind of a flatter dip over on this section, this section here. They plan things accordingly. So plants that need more water are closer to the um, swale. Plants that need less water are high and dry. Catchment ponds. Not everybody can have these. Certainly if you're in a small space, it doesn't make sense. There's all sort, sorts of rules about ponds and kids and access to the backyard and depths and that sort of thing. So, so disclaimer there, when you're um, using a catchment pond, read all the rules and regulations. Um, catchment ponds are great if you've got clay soil, uh, that will hold some water for even a short period of time. Um, you can use liners if you want. Not everybody does. Sometimes it's trickier to keep uh, rainwater catchment ponds clean with a liner because nothing's ever being filtered through. And, and, and the other thing about that is that as you're utilizing your catchment pond and it's 
also draining at the same time, you're helping to replenish that aquifer by having allowing it to go down into the ground. Where if you have a, a pond, you'd be overflowing all, uh, excuse me, a liner, you'd be overflowing all the time if you didn't have a plan in place for that. So catchment ponds, though, um, these can be really great in particular um, places. Uh, we utilize tubing to direct all that rainwater into the catchment pond during the driest parts of the, uh, excuse me, during the parts of the season where we have massive rain flow and we fill the pond because the ducks haven't been washed in, you know, months and they're full of mud or whatever. Um, and then from this point, once you collect the water, you can either, either utilize this to grow more plants inside this pond space and up along the edges. Uh, you can build habitat, just have habitat space. That's perfectly acceptable for water, um, uh, water catchment if you're also replenishing the aquifer at the same time. Um, and sometimes, you know, you just want your ducks to have fun. Before, <laughs> habitat improvement. I'd say that's pretty solid. So this is our catchment pond down here. We've got cattails growing inside of here. I mean, anytime you put plants and root systems in your pond, in your catchment pond system, you're going to hold more water in there for longer periods of time. So then I can siphon or flood or pump if I want to any of this water down here. The ducks keep it clean and pest free. When the ducks are gone, I have more problems and have to reconsider this, uh, this system right here. This then goes to fill a tank that's above ground. You've got a question? No? Anybody else? Okay. So then if this pond overflows or when it does, then it feeds all of, and the water is just seeping into the ground here, uh, moving from water energy into plant energy. This is the same catchment pond early, early, early spring, right before the trees were um, starting to break and or right when they started to break at several days post rainfall. So we still have plenty. There's about two feet in the bottom of this section, just in this middle circle here that these ducks are uh, still hanging into or hanging out in. And when I when I look at this and I go out here and observe, I'm thinking this is several days post, but it's not several enough to really make a difference for when I need the, to utilize that water again, if I need to pull water out of there. So because I don't want to use a liner, and because it has ducks, so it's can also ducks and liners are so gross, filthy, filthy. Ducks are so dirty. Um, so I want that water to drain and replenish, but I want it to do a little bit slower than the pace it's going. So I've just started planting all in this level here, which is technically considered like a bog layer, bog level, which then you can get into natural pond building and you're gone. You'll, we'll never see any of you again. It's a cool rabbit hole, super cool. So getting root systems established in there can help uh, keep water and catchment ponds longer for longer periods of time. Everybody feeling good? It's a lot of information so far. What if you just want to get a peek at it? See what I did there? Anybody? No? Nobody here's punny? Oh. Can you start small? Yes, you can. Uh, so try not to be intimidated by all these steps and processes we're talking about. If all you have is a window and a tote, try it. Put it anywhere. I still have this system. I kid you not, it travels with me from house to house. I love it. I always have a leak somewhere in some sort of five or six strip line, and I throw together whatever I have in the moment in the greenhouse. This window fills this entire tote and spills over. And all of this is planted, the big swale underneath here is uh, fed then when this overflows, all gets water in this area. So start with that. I only have this and this and this, try it. And then modify it, change it, adapt it. Start with a drip in a bucket. I don't have any way to collect water off of a flappy corrugated piece of metal that I'm is, you know, semi supporting some things for a minute while in between rooftops. Uh, not at my house. I have a roof. Uh, so start with that drip bucket. You'd be surprised how quickly that bucket will fill. And then what do you do with this bucket? You've got all these buckets all over the place, You're catching all these drips, and you're tripping over those. So what do you do with them? You get out your super soaker. It's my favorite tool, really. It is. 
it's excellent when you've got your five gallon bucket and maybe you need to sip over the bucket and water a couple of things that are right around it. Um, water containers that are on a patio, spot water plants by maybe you have young trees or shrubs and then you put deep water and three gallons goes on there and then you spot water with the remaining two gallons. Maybe you give it all five gallons. Um, House plants, bring some of that water inside. You know, we use so much of our water inside here. Also, everybody loves house plants these days. So why don't you utilize that resource that you have and, and water your house plants with it? No. Okay. So how do we even calculate what we could potentially get from our rooftop if we're just looking at our single rooftop? I don't math. Here's Jess. <laughs> so um, it's not that hard. To, you can have, like, you can take a picture of this, do your calculations at home. They also have really handy online systems, too, where you just have to put in the square footage of your rooftop and it'll pop out that number for you. So let's say you've got, you know, your 30 foot by 50 foot, like, roof. Um, so you've got 1500 square feet for your house and we're just going to multiply that um, area amount by the amount of rain in inches and our average rainfall here is 13 inches in the Treasure Valley. And then the internet gave me a magic number. Um, so I don't math either. Sometimes maths. Right, so just um, that number will get the, um, the quantity of gallons. So by this example for a 1500 square foot house, uh, you can capture 12,000 gallons of rainwater, which is a small pool, which is a ton of water. And then if you have a pool, it helps you feel really good about filling up that pool with all your other water. <laughs> so, um, just with, you know, I really love looking at these numbers and seeing how much of a difference you can make. and. I think 12,000 gallons of water in our high desert climate is really impressive for rainwater catchment. And you don't always have to be catching it. I do a lot of rainwater catchment where I just flow it into my garden instead of having it um, kind of sit there in the driveway puddling. And it's really nice to actually help replenish the aquifer instead of sending 12,000 gallons of water from every house down the stream. So, the other thing I'd add about what Jess is saying about directing water into um, beds. Well, why are you directing? I get this question all the time. Why are you filtering water into beds while it's raining? Well, our rainfall on the ground proper is, you know, a 16th of an inch. But collectively, if we're pulling that all off and getting all of those gallons, not 12,000 at once, obviously, um, to that, that space, then you're supporting deep water. You, you're starting to have, uh, often our soil becomes hydrophobic, uh, repels water, and we get so dry here. And so it takes slow watering. So that nice top water that's a 16th of an inch that's happening kind of uh, conditions the, the soil to be able to then pull the rest of that water from your, that you're directing during, through your downspout uh, into those beds during that same rainstorm, making it so that your rainwater collection is much more effective. Yes. Yeah. Is that... Data County's average rainfall versus precipitation because so much of our precip here comes as snow, and I don't want to use that in my calculation for my rainwater capture. I think it is. I can double check. Or does anybody know? Is there a good source to yeah, find just rainfall, or maybe you do it by season? I suppose. I, I think that's out. total annual. Precip. Yeah, I think that's annual precip. Once you didn't get snow. Lied to all. Oh, not again. We're <laughs> <laughs> recording this. <laughs> this was the, the case for not recording. <laughs> that happened. That's a good point. So I guess this does vary then from uh, if you are collecting in the winter or not. And I imagine that that would be tricky and you have to have a more complicated system. So Yeah, so I think there are probably sources where we can look at rainfall by month. Yeah. So you can look at the non-freezing months, right? Yeah. right. Sure. So yeah. April through whenever. And there's a conversion for snow, but but still, it'd be nice to just know. Yeah, it'd just be nice to know when we're not going to be freezing. I just looked it up, and it says Ada County gets 13 inches of rain and of rain. Uh, 16 inches of snow. Yes. Oh, okay. 
inch and a half. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, you're not. You're not yeah. lying. You didn't lie. <laughs> Thanks. Um, the other thing, talk about snow in a minute, right? Yeah, perfect. At the end, yes. If we get there, everybody hang in there. Everybody gonna make it to you? If you need to leave, of course. Don't make a big scene. Hopefully, we won't make out. <laughs> and this is also if you're only calculating a 30 by 50 foot roof. If you've got more or less than that, you want to, of course, play into that. And and also, that's why it's important to collect off of every possible rooftop option you can. We have systems in place for collecting roof uh, rainwater off the chicken coop, and that water is stored and then is feeding. That is the chicken's water. That's just what they're using. That's a spectacular system. It's not, not drawing any resources and collecting what would otherwise just be in a poopy, mucky mess down there. Poopy monkey mess. Talking to my children. I don't say that. Oh, right. <laughs> okay. Now we've gotten the water from where we where it's collected to where we want it to go, and how do we keep it there? Because if we're just quickly getting that water there and it's running through, and then the wind comes through and everything is dried out, and now we have no water again. And uh, how do we keep it in place longer? Maximize your water holding and retaining capacity by building your soil. And what does building your soil mean? It means layering and layering and layering and layering and layering and never stop layering ever. Uh, layers of organic matter diversify them. That could be leaves or straw or a different kind of leaf the next year or some sort of wood mulch or maybe it's wood chip one year and dairy mulch the next year. Uh, living mulches, which means something like a creeping thyme ground cover. Uh, even uh, vining vegetables are considered uh, a living mulch, something that's going to keep your earth covered. Chopping and dropping. Is anyone familiar with that term? Cool. It's not everyone. So if you go through and you're cleaning up your, your perennials during the season at the end of the year and everything retracts back into the ground and you really aren't into winter interest, you're going to chop it, leave it on the ground. Chop, drop, the end. Start building organic matter in those spaces. Um, Go ahead. For a nutrition profile and different uh, part particulate size, it breaks down faster. No scientists quote me on that. <laughs> that was a good quick answer, though. Thank you. Um, oh, I've been playing, uh, experimenting a lot with building some of these tanks for my swales in particular. Is anyone familiar with hugo culture? Yes. Google culture is a super, super cool permaculture technique where you're basically taking all of your um, debris from your space. Maybe you have a tree that needed to come out for something and you're laying down big logs and then little logs and then leaves. It's like glorified lasagna gardening and you're making a big mound. Well, I was, I was thinking about that concept because uh, these hugel culture mounds hold water, slowly break down nutrition and help feed everything that's planted above it. It's just this closed loop super awesome system. So I thought, okay, if I want to deconstruct that, how can I make those things work in a space that I can watch them for a while? So I've lined some of my swales, my flood swales, um, with logs or sticks or parts of logs that are then wedged into the ground. Uh, some of them in particular are wedged up against sand because I have swale. Ah. So I have, can you guys see okay? Land, swale, berm, and about this point on is all sand. These are high and dry xeric plants up here. This is sage. High and dry, desert plant. That's somebody who took, who, fancy their sage. Okay, so sand here. This is my swale. I started putting logs, so they're in the mud, in the clay. My, my water level comes up. My water level comes up to about here. 
this gets saturated and then this whole log gets uh gets saturated with water and then the sand pulls water from this log and just tiny tiny, tiny feeds these high and dry xeric plants that i need them to water because i'm not pulling a hose out to the back for you to do this so i've got my swale i've got logs all stacked in here some pieces of like bark edges and whatnot, some sticks. <laughs> so I'm just in the process of trialing this right now. And so far it's proving to be a functional system, which just makes me so excited. Anyway, that's what I'm doing with logs. <laughs> what is that term you said? Google culture, H-U-G-E-L-K-U-L-T-U-R. We did, we did yes. something like that. We, we just moved and my wife took a bunch of the plants and we just stuck them in this one corner of the yard because uh, because we're tearing up the whole yard, we're, we're remodeling yeah. and stuff. And uh, we cut down a bunch of uh, 60, or we trimmed down a bunch of 60 year old uh, uh, lilac bushes. Oh, nice. And so anyway, we had this giant, giant pile of very woody um, waste and, uh, and then they dug out the foundation for the addition and I said, pile it on there. And we planted a couple, you know, a couple things on there. And what we're finding right now, because nothing's broken down, it's requiring a lot of water. Right. You know, because it just it drains away some. And you had soil and then logs, or you had your soil put on top of your brush pile? Uh, soil put on top of the brush pile. pile. Okay. Yeah. And so and there probably isn't enough, enough there, but I'm thinking by next spring will probably be okay. Yeah. It's already breaking down. And give yourself a really good layer, like eight to twelve inches of leaf matter this winter, and then you could top it off with something else to capture all that, like wood chips or something. Yeah. Oh, I just uh, wanted to mention that um, we have kind of a modified system that I've been using in my raised guard beds. Yeah. Um, and I just dig up the dirt in the spring, and when I have like grass clippings and whatever around kitchen waste, and um, basically dig large holes, like trench composting. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Okay, I guess that's probably the term for it. Just dig deep in my beds and then cover it over with dirt. And I had the huge worms in there. Cool. Massive. Feeding, stuff. no way, closed loop. Yeah. Can't be mad at that. Okay. So we all know the way to maximize our uh, water holding and, re and retention capacity in our soils to build and build and build and build and build our soil. Um, here's just an example of underneath this bed, there was another mulch from the year before. All the leaves were done for the season, so all of those went into the bed, and then I put another layer of compost on top of it. This compost, wood, this is a black forest compost, which is the uh, composted floor of the wood mill. So it's like cascade compost, that real woody um, mill compost. Beautiful dark and a, a lighter nutrition profile because it's multiple kinds of trees usually. Anyway, so that gets layered and layered and layered, and then I'll do the same thing each year. Intensive, and sometimes I'm not. Straw, cedar, just showing different kinds of mulches. Um, here's that log system. Oh, good. Stoked I have this photo in here. Here's this. This is the swale when it's full of water. The logs and pieces of, of woody debris are in here. And then this is that sand layer that's already pulling that water up. I also have a straw layer and some areas, you know, straw holds water so nicely. It gets really matted down there. So I have a, on one side, if I have a, a circle, I have like an island berm and the swale goes all the way around it nearly. So on one side, I am trying just the logs and on the other side, I am trying both logs with a layer of uh, straw that goes right before the sand layer. So far, they're both successful. Consider a different kind of drip system, little bits that add up. So maybe you have a drip, but you don't really have the space to put in a system or you can't really collect anything off of it. Maybe there's, it's just not, it's bothering you, put a plant there. Look for plants that need water just in, during those seasonal rains. A lot of our native plants um, are that way. Or put a container on rollers and roll that under that drip. And then put the next one under there. And then the next one under there. Intensive and passive. Intensive and passive. Passive, intensive. This water feature is the one that is um, 
here now that used to be next to uh, or that used to be the water trough that was on the side of the patio that was I was overflowing into the garden. This is now just the functioning system that only works during the rainy parts of the the month. Otherwise, the whole thing drains and and uh, dries up for the year. But I collect this tank is probably or this this container is probably this tall and this wide, and it stays full during most of the spring and summer. Oh, the spring and fall into quite a bit of the summer until everything evaporates. And it doesn't work anymore. So then I can grow my uh, water press in here early season and then be done once the weather's too hot anyway. Taking a look at um, systems that you already have in place. Maybe you have downspouts and not a lot of bandwidth and you've got a couple of buckets sitting out. You're just kind of checking to see what's going on around and you're observing and interacting. Well, one thing you can do um, either permanently or just between phases is consider the opportunities that are already there. Right now, this downspout and this downspout are just going off into a big mulch field. Well, what if instead you connected a perforated tube? Does everyone know what I mean with, by perforated tubes? I've seen those that have holes down the whole way so they allow water to percolate throughout the entire. So maybe you connect a perforated tube in this space right here Maybe it has a Y on it so that overflow can happen. I'm not sure how you exactly you, you put this whole thing together. And then this water is this bed that's protected by the eave up here. It doesn't get any water otherwise. And this is early season wildflowers. So often those aren't things that need water long term. They just need help getting germinated. <clears throat> Let's, any questions before I jump, jump into this? Okay. Um, Let's talk a little bit about designing with rainwater catchment in mind uh, when you're designing your landscape. Um, so we're going to go back, of course, to observing and interacting. Um, when you are when you are designing with water catch, catchment in mind, you want to first ask why are you capturing water? What is the goal on your other than you don't want it to go downstream? So remove that part. Why do you decide you want to capture water in your space and water um, use that to water your landscape? Is it that you want to supplement some of your watering in the summer? Is it that you want to only rely on rainwater for your entire landscape? Um, do you just need to water your indoor house plants because you feel funny about that? Whatever, whatever your thing is, put a goal in, in front of you. And it doesn't mean that goal can't change. It's just your starting point because you're probably going to be so stoked after your first water catchment bucket and you're shocked at how much overflow has happened from your five gallon bucket after one rain in the desert. And you're going, I should have had six barrels out here already. So think about what you want that goal to be first and then maybe long-term. Uh, consider using plants that only need seasonal water. Bulbs are awesome for that. Uh, they typically only need the water from the winter to, to be soaked up into their big bulbous root systems and then, um, and then they bloom with no water and don't want anything else throughout the summer. Think that way. Put plants in that want the water when we have the water option most of the time. Often, that means many of our native and regionally adapted plants. So you can have lush and full and beautiful and water three times a year. And maybe that also includes the sky. And maybe that means you're flooding some of these spaces. Examples of plants. This whole space gets watered uh, this year. Uh, I think we're on five times this year, and that's an increase from the last two years, which were three and four. So I've had to increase one every year. Is that right? Yeah, over the last couple of years, uh, because we're in such a, a deficit. And this also gets, this is zone 647 out here. It's like, radiant heat from the house and a sidewalk and the circle and every other house around. So it is extreme up in this space. But I add wood chips or some sort of mulch to this space every single year just so I can keep getting organic matter on there. These guys, Schuberti alliums. Oh, they're like this big. They're so cool. S-C-H-U-B-E-R-T-E-I. Maybe double time. Any other questions? But you know, we go through in those first several months, everything looks really lush and beautiful. But now we've had 
three months of 100 degrees and we're cranky and so is everything else. So that means we need to utilize uh, our water system now at this point. Um, when you're utilizing water systems like this after extreme drought and the, water, the soil is not conditioned, you've got to be really patient. Uh, usually it's become hydrophobic. There's big cracks in the ground if you, if you have bare soil. Um, so you can utilize uh, your gravity fed tanks or whatever you're storing from your, from your collection tanks. And then you can take a hose or PVC and lay those out wherever you want that to go. When you're watering in spaces like this, often you're getting out there with a tiny rake or a shovel and you're making tiny trenches in this mulch. Because uh, if your entire space has been flat and walked on for the last three months during drought when there's no water, you're, no water is going to seep through. You really need to make some space, places for this, for the water to go. So you just get out there and you pull your hoe or your rake or your shovel along that space and direct the water where you want it to go. A couple of days later, come through and, and cover it up or not. Either way, depends on if you like the look of swales all over your yard or not. And this space you saw is a micro space. This is a small um, yard. So you, you know, and plants are tight together. So you can't necessarily see that there's a water trench that goes through here. So you're getting out there and guiding and directing water as it's coming out. One thing I'd recommend when you're utilizing your water from your resource tank, uh, when you've got a hose, is that um, have some way of, of turning that off so that you're not going from plant and then you've got to run across the driveway and you've met me while all that water is gone. Um, When you're thinking about how you're going to be designing your space, you want to collect plant put uh, collect plants together that have like needs. So high and dry goes together, or uh, dry items, dry plants go together in higher areas where lower areas that would stay wetter longer or collect water easier um, would go. Uh, more water thirsty plants would go in lower spaces. You'll have more water thirsty plants closer to your resource where um, dry desert plants can be out farther because you probably aren't going to water out there as often. Questions there? When you're looking at your plant selection, do you even need the water thirsty plants? And sometimes that answer really is yes, because you have consistent boggy areas. We really do have a lot of um, bog boggy problems here that uh, stay wet all, all summer long and they could have no irrigation system. It's just that they're in a very compacted um, development that's probably new and all the soil was stripped and now they're on hard pan or clay or something that's not allowing that, that water to dry out. So maybe you do need to capture utilizing a plant that needs more water. Seasonal tips, we'll talk about winter. Spring, you all can guess we're gonna observe and interact. Uh, early spring, we are setting up and expanding new systems. We paid attention to what just happened in the winter, uh, how much rainfall or snow we just got. Uh, uh, we are checking our ex existing systems if there were cracks or leaks because we didn't drain our tanks enough or maybe we didn't drain our tanks at all or maybe we accidentally forgot that the tank was still, you know, whatever happened, there's some repairs to be done. Um, prepare for excess water. Typically spring is when we're filling most of our buckets up, at least for the duration of the summer. Uh, because we get most of our water in the, during the winter, that's not really when we have to utilize most of it other than under trees uh, or protected areas. Uh, we see a lot of folks that will plant bulbs under eaves. They still need to be watered and collect that water from the sky and that's not happening if it's protected. So some of your fall or winter water will go into um, watering those bulbs or trees. Uh, apply mulch. Winter has happened, things have blown away, some things have compacted. If you need to add mulch, having a good three to four inches on at all times is, is a sweet spot. Uh, you know, eight or 12 inches of leaf mulch in the fall really is only about two or three inches come spring. Uh, use up, start using what you've collected already uh, from early spring rains or late winter rains that are not snow or snow melt. If it's been warm enough to turn your, um, uh, put your systems back up and get your systems back up and running. Um, this is the best time to store water for our, for our summer uh, drought. 
And then paying attention to what areas in the spring are still wet from winter water on its own from the sky. If those, if you have areas that are still wet, maybe that's not somewhere that you need to collect water or keep water or direct water. You can just keep going out to those areas that are still bone dry. There will be plenty of them. So this is the time of year that you'll start preparing water to where it needs to go long term into those dry beds for summer. Anticipating what's going to be uh, based on your note taking from your journals. Any questions on spring? Okay, summer again, observing and interacting, but we are pretty well in survival mode. The water we have is the water that we have. We're not getting a whole lot of resources, so utilizing that as wisely as you can. Paying attention to what's happening with the actual plant. If it, if you just feel like you haven't watered in a water while, I should probably water and everything looks fine. You probably don't need to water. But if you haven't watered in a while and the plants look really sad, that's when you utilize the water. Not assuming ahead of time or, or moving that ahead of time if it's really not necessary. Especially if you prepared by planting uh, native or, or drought tolerant plants. Um, you're going to be assessing your plants and your soil. These areas look really dry and they've got cracks. That means I need more mulch. That means I need to be able to hold water here. But for longer periods of times, how am I going to add organic matter? Uh, get ready to fill those tanks because fall's coming. And even if it's really late, we want to be prepared to collect water. This can be a really awesome, no stopping point kind of a obsession. You know, you'll you'll get excited and you'll fill your bucket and then by spring, all of your buckets are full and you're trying to plan how you're going to fit 12 more buckets in this row. Now you feel like you have to go up. I mean, this it's just endless possibilities for, for collection. It's amazing. It will, we will stop raining at some point. So that, I mean, it's not endless, endless. Um, so then... If you've, if you've taken notes, then you can gauge how much of this tank filled after how many rainfalls and how much have I utilized already this much this year. So do I need to, to cap bank on capturing more for next year? Do I want to? Do I have the bandwidth? Uh, slow deep watering in the summer. This means your trees. Um, water who is showing what needs support. If the plant isn't saying, hey, I'm droopy and really sad and borderline here, um, then let it, let it keep going. It's seeking those deep root, that water deep, and, and you're supporting deep root systems. Make, start making notes about in the summer about any plants that needed to be swapped. I thought this should go here, but it really isn't getting hit by my swale, so I need to probably move it to somewhere that is or replace it with something else or give it to my neighbor or plant share or whatever. Oh, right now, we're heading into this. So this is another. They're all, you're observing and interacting all the time. So who thrived this year? You're taking lots of notes. Who struggled? Now's the time to be transplanting and swapping those things so root systems can get developed in the winter. Did water get to where it needed to go? Did you find a way to collect more because you probably needed more? Um, watch the weather and be prepared to collect again. This is the time of year where you might dig a little hole. And, and sometimes you're putting systems in place in the fall because that's when the rain is happening and you've got rain and then a week and then rain and you want to make some progress so start experimenting during the fall too doesn't mean that whole system has to be in place right away but just being able to visually see what might happen with whatever topography is happening in your yard uh, is really helpful this time of year um we mentioned before you need to condition your soil after a dry season so if you're utilizing the water you have left over it needs to be really low and slow uh, pressure. Uh, water your evergreens to get them ready for winter. So if you need to drain your tank because you know there's a big storm coming and it's been four days of rain, stay drained for a minute. It's awesome. I feel better. Um, then empty those tanks by utilizing them under your uh, tree canopies. Um, and then applying mulch. Once again, if all the mulch blew away because you had a really windy uh, we had a really windy summer or your dogs, you have six dogs and the mulch has become the lawn and it's all over the place, three to four inches, three to four inches, three to four inches all the time. So sometimes that means you're applying mulch once again, or you're allowing those leaves to drop and leafing them on the ground. Again, we're checking our systems and making repairs and expanding. Because you probably will expand. Winter, can you collect in the winter? 
And really, my answer is kind of yes so far. That's that's what I've come up with. Everybody has um, that I've seen systems in place is able to collect in some way in the winter. Usually, in my experience, my open tanks that are outside get a good layer of ice on top of those. Um, I'm not typically pulling. Honestly, there's not a lot of water being collected most of that time period because it's so cold, it's just kind of hanging out there. I'm not doing a lot of watering when it's freezing. You know, and the, it's not going anywhere on the ground anyway, because it's been a hard freeze through the ground. So when you ask about fall valves and turning those on during the winter, I'm just not, I, the, the most that I do with my trough tanks is bucket system, push that ice cap down and fill my bucket. And then I just spot water a couple of things. Most of the time it's evergreens if we've had no water in the winter. Because we actually have very dry winters and most of our uh, our precipitation comes that very tail end. And that's why some of our trees are so damaged after these last couple of really dry winters because nothing's getting any water, the water that it needs like it's used to. Um, typically we reduce our water tanks, like both the closed tanks. It's, it's not easy to keep water in a closed tank. Uh, there's, you need to leave room for expansion. So if you've got a closed tank or a cistern or something like that, uh, a rain barrel, you want to drain it quite a bit. Sometimes that's like half, sometimes that's three fourths. The metal is a little bit easier. It kind of allows a little expansion without breaking any of the seams. At least I haven't had that trouble so far, but also um, because I am assuming at my tank size, I still have a good amount of water on the bottom. And I can then turn my hose bit that's attached to the bottom of that trough. Did you guys see those? Usually if you've got a tank, you've got a hose bit on the bottom, that is all still flowing out fine. Just hook up a short hose and, and it's not a problem. In my experience, I'm not, I'm not turning PVC valves or anything at finer metal. Oh. Shoveling your driveway snow, utilizing your snow that is on pavement, assuming you don't have any kind of salts that you're or deicers, but utilizing I am that that person absolutely in the middle of the snowstorm shoveling my driveway into a wheelbarrow and wheelbarrowing it to underneath my uh, evergreens and, and spreading it out. It's everybody loves to watch that. <laughs> or even at least just onto the lawn because that sounds like yeah. a lot of work. Yeah, but you can just you want to put it onto something <laughs> other than the. the... And then your fruit needs to belong in the right? Huh? Great and idea. And then your snow will work and dump it right into the right. And there are things that do not want piles of snow on them. You know, really woody um, plants, perennials, or shrubs do not want snow piled halfway up their, their branching. But if you've got things that are retreating into the ground over the winter, or you've got lawn next to your driveway, like a lot of folks do, shovel that over there, not onto the street, which is not even allowed. You heard that here. <laughs> um, this is really important. You know, snow happening in the winter is one of the best ways for us to watch where snow melt happens, because often you can't you can't see the water once it's below the mulch line or the grass or whatever you've got going on there. Um, so paying attention to where the snow melts first and last. And of course, that will change because of sun throughout the summer. Um, snow melts not happening in the summer. Do you know what I mean? Your, your, uh, your shady spaces and sunny spaces are going to change once summer sun hits. But paying attention to where you might be able to capture water longer, where you might be able to store your water tanks to keep them in warmer spaces. Typically, you try and find a spot that has more radiant heat. That's why we often do up against the house. Also, that's just kind of out of sight, out of mind as far as visual disturbance goes. Uh, but then you're collecting radiant heat, and that's helping keep those tanks. Uh, yep, yep, absolutely. Yeah, for sure, which then would help insulate your house. See, I'm everything like that makes me so excited. <laughs> And do you then find at the end of the winter when your snow is melting, do you have opportunities to collect there? Is it pooling right here always? What do you do about that? I have some folks who, this is kind of an interesting concept that we're still kind of working through, but they have live in a, a town home and they have a, this probably double size 
and a downspout and everything else is concrete around it. Mm -hmm. And so they have dug this giant hole and filled it up with some gravel. And then we're gonna plant some things in there to capture what it means that will tolerate uh, more water down low and the higher stuff and see if it works. It's like rain gardening in a desert or something, that's what we call it. But it's, you know, utilizing it and taking and looking and trying to be innovative about your solutions when you've got some sort of a challenge like a box surrounded by all concrete and just the downspout going there. That's a great opportunity to then capture and replenish and go, see, I see we can. Because we can. And then lastly, remembering that rainwater is never a guarantee. So collect what you can, whatever you can, and use it wisely. That's it, you guys. We made it. That was faster than the last one. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Questions, things to share. What's up? Yeah. Uh, early in the session, you mentioned pumps, and you're not a big fan of them. Uh, but I have a big space, and I need to move water a long yeah. ways. And even if I elevate my tanks, I don't have enough pressure to move it. So, super talk fair. a little bit about pumps, and if you have to live with them, what to look for and what to look out for. Uh, clean them all the time. Really, it's just the filter is the problem okay. most of the time. So, and especially if it's coming off the off of a, a, the rooftop, you're going to be have a filter to change frequently with leaves coming down in there and whatnot. So that's the only thing I'd say. Probably weekly. If you're using your water tank weekly, I would check your filter as part of your regular watering system. And and probably, I'm not a You'd want to get like middle grade to higher grade pump. Otherwise, you're just going through pumps constantly. They're not really set up to filter like they say they are, which is, is the frustration. Because then if those if the filter gets too um, gross and everything passes through, then you've gunked up the whole system. So they're just high maintenance is all. Yeah. And if high maintenance is your option, you just kind of have to Learn well, it's either teaching. that or all the labor of moving that water manually. Um, that doesn't sound does like Does anybody make a decent uh, solar pump for this kind of use? Not no. that I have found yet. They're, and they're all really small. Um, I have a couple of clients who have purchased a few things, and I will say no words on them until probably two years mm -hmm. of utilizing it. Because if you're having to replace a pump every single year, that's not a sustainable system. Mm -hmm. You've got to figure something else out. And maybe that means, um, maybe that means pop-up, PVC pop-up emitters at your space mm -hmm. and uh, to get things from, you know, long distances. Right now, are you, do you flood irrigate too? Or at your home? No, right now I have six of those 50 gallon barrels and they, you'd be amazed how fast they fill. Right. Like 10, inch, 10 inch rainstorm. It's just it's remarkable. Worst. But right now I'm using that water to fill a five gallon bucket or a water can or something. So I'm hand watering. Yeah. And that's, too, I don't have time to do that. Right. No, I'm a, I'm a bucketer also. I've got blackberries and raspberries and things that like water. So those plus a lot of native forbs and things. So maybe. I've got to move. Water like, distance. Here to the other wall. Yeah. So if you've got to use a pump, research the best pump. Make sure it's got a stellar filter system that's also really easy to access when you're cleaning it. Uh, that's usually the biggest problem is the filter. Wouldn't you say that was a couple Does anybody of else have experience with pump? I don't have it. I have a pump, but I have not actually ever. Oh, because I you're on the city now. Yeah. I just have water. That's right. And I got a pump to use it. So it's sitting in my garage. And pumps are certainly worse with canal water than they are um, rooftop water. Canal water, you're asking it to filter fruit salad. <laughs> We've been pumping from our irrigation systems. We have flood irrigation, so we have pump out of our ditch and no issues yet, but it's also the first year with this pump. And I'm afraid that it might be a one season pump, especially since my husband thought it was fine to put it on muddy floor oh. um, <laughs> turned it on for the first time. So we'll see. Um but some pumps are meant to pass particulates. Right. It has uh, a big filter. So I'm wondering, I'm really hoping it's one of those. There's no filter. If the impeller can take it, it just goes through. Yeah, and so I'm screening I'm filter. screening the water before it goes into my tanks. Okay. So there's a little bit of screening going on anyway. So if I can find something that would just pass, I don't have 
to worry about leaves and other debris. And then at the end, are you terminating with sprinklers? I'll send you my sorry. At the end, are you terminating with sprinklers or drip lines or what is the what do you want to happen when it gets to where it needs to go? Still designing that. I got to figure okay. out how to get it there, but I prefer drip lines or something. Drip lines certainly would need a pump, even yeah. if you did non check valve. You need, you need pressure to come out of there besides what's being gravity fed. And it wouldn't be long enough if you were going to gravity feed into drip line. I don't think it would be enough pressure for long enough for it to actually move anything. Right. I think you'd be barely dripping water. One of my neighbors, she did the same thing, which is where we found this pump. Um, and she got a hose attachment so she could attach a hose to PVC and drilled hose, uh, holes in the PVC pipe oh, that cool. runs in a lawn. Um, she did it in her lawn because she has a sloped lawn, but I cool. think if you're watering berries, that would be really cool to move a lot of water quickly. Yeah. And then the nice thing about that too is those berries really don't want water at the very end so they can concentrate all those sugars in the berry too. So right. by the time the season was over and your water tanks were empty, okay. Yeah, exactly. 